All right, we might go ahead and get started then. Dave, I'll go ahead and pass it on to you. All right, well, thank you very much and uh, appreciate the opportunity to put together this information. Um, been working with NAF here, we're developing now quarterly market reports to provide folks with updates on what's happening in the marketplace and, and what are we showing. And then having these webinars webinars to kind of fill in some of the gaps and, and take a deeper dive into some of the topics that, that we're looking uh, about. So just as an introduction, I'm Dave Carter. I've um, been knocking around agriculture for about 45 years. I've worked a lot with tribal groups on um, some uh, food sufficiency and food sovereignty initiatives on meat processing. I've done a lot of work in cooperative development and, and have a background in the pet food industry, which is one of the things that we're gonna talk about today. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll um, kind of talk about <clears throat> some of the things that we're looking at ahead for the marketplace uh, this coming year. And when we think about it, um, that's me 20 years ago. So I always appreciate the fact that NAF uses a much younger version of me and that and the things. But we uh, want to take a look at three things today. First of all, want to take a look at what do we see ahead here in 2022? What are some of the major uh, trends that are going to impact the marketplace? Secondly, uh, we want to introduce a new market basket report that um, I'm working with NAF to, to put together that we'll be publishing on a, on a quarterly basis. And then three, we're going to take a, a deeper dive into pet food because that's such an opportunity for, particularly as a lot of the meat processing projects are coming to fruition of how do we utilize that, that whole animal. So let's start off with taking a look at uh, what my very foggy crystal ball is, is seeing here moving forward in, in 2022. So first of all, we're, we're glad to report that COVID is fading. Well, maybe not so quick. Um, it seemed like we were headed on the right track as we finished up last year. And then all of a sudden the Omicron variant came along and just kind of knocked us in the side of the head, uh, particularly over the last you know, month. And so what does all of that mean? Well, when we look at it, what we're seeing is that um, we're seeing an amplification of the disruption in the supply chain. Not only the, the usual factors, but you know, within the truck driving, the warehouses, within the restaurants, the retailers, not only is there a shorter of, of workers, but workers that are there because this new strain is so contagious as you've got a lot more workers that are um, calling in sick uh, because they have. But at the same time, it's interesting that it's almost like we've become to accept COVID as, as a part of life and let's just live with it because we're seeing that um, that consumer confidence is, is rising and that bodes well for you know, what we can look that maybe people will be wanting to buy some new products or different products as, as we move forward. So here, what we did was we took a look at several of the surveys that, that came about and I tried to distill it from you know, folks are involved in the retail side, the restaurant side, the ingredient supply side. So we took the survey that one of the major natural retailers uh, put out. We used um, HelloFresh, which is a, a home delivery service, Specialty Foods Association, which monitors those type of things and kind of distilled some of the, the key findings that are coming out. And first one that, that came to the top is what we call the protein wars are going to continue. And that's just this tug between the animal-based proteins and the, what some of us might call fake meat, but is the plant-based uh, alternatives or even the cultured meat that's, that's coming about right now. And what we're finding out is that a growing number of consumers are adopting what they call a flexitarian diet, is that they're not giving up animal proteins in, 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 you know, in favor of something else, but they're starting to balance that out. And because the protein sector is continuing to grow overall, what we're seeing is even as some of those plant-based alternatives are coming on, they're not eating into the market share of the animal protein. So we're seeing both of those continuing to grow. The whole desire for transparency is just continuing to grow exponentially. 
Um, and COVID really brought that to the forefront. When COVID exposed the lack of resiliency in the uh, conventional industrialized consolidated food system, people started to say, wait a second, maybe I can do better if I could have a, a, a local connection or understand you know, how this food is made. I just need to know what's going on because somebody has been pulling the wool over my eyes for, for, for too long. We're starting to see the growth of the concept of food as medicine. People are realizing more and more that what we eat and how we eat affects how well we live and how long we live. And so they're really looking for foods that you know, are low in antioxidants or high in certain characteristics. And, and particularly because of the uncertainty with COVID, you know, COVID kind of makes us feel like we have no control over our health. Here's this virus that could come in and attack us. So, but when it comes to things that we can control, we know that our diet is a part of that. And so we're seeing more consumers really gravitate toward that. And then related to the transparency is just the growth of uh, people deliberately picking out products that are either sustainably produced or locally produced. And you've got about a third of the consumers now that are making that a part of their decision matrix when they go into the grocery store or even go into a restaurant to, to order a meal. I thought this was interesting that there are certain foods every year they talk about, okay, here are the, the end foods that are going to be coming up. And the, the four that I found very interesting that are forecast for 2022 is that we're seeing a huge growth in ancient grains, traditional grains. Again, people are, do not trust uh, the, the conventional, highly processed commercial wheat, corn, you know, whatever. They think, and there's a good basis for this, is that those traditional grains have got a lot more of the basic nutrition in them that hasn't been processed out. So things like kamut and quinoa, um, amaranth, those type of things are, are really coming to the, the surface. Sunflower seeds, um, that speaks to me because I'm a huge consumer of sunflower seeds. Every road trip, I go through about four bags, but, but it's beyond just the you know, thing you snack in while you're driving along. You're starting to see it in a lot of products, in salad mixes, crackers, those type of things. And then you're seeing a return to the meat sector. I talked about the protein wars, but we're really seeing a number of meat eaters that have said, okay, I'm gonna go try Impossible Burger or Beyond Beef or whatever. And they've tried it and they go, eh, it's okay, but I really want a steak. I really want a good beef burger. I want a good bison burger. And so we're seeing that there's a, a real growth in that. And then the fourth one is the humanization of pets. I won't talk about that now. That's just a teaser for what we're gonna talk about here in, in a minute. So that's sort of what the, what the crystal ball is, is showing. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we want to introduce uh, the quarterly market basket report that we are able to pull together uh, thanks to the partnership that Native American Agriculture Fund has with the SPINS and the IRI databases. SPINS IRI is a major service that captures data from most of the retailers, both conventional folks like Kroger and Walmart and Target, as well as the natural stores like Natural Grocers and Sprouts and the like. And anytime somebody goes into those stores and they buy a product, when that UPC code goes across the cash register, SPINS captures that data, and we have the ability to pull that down and take a look. And so what we decided we want to do is we want to put together on a quarterly basis a market basket report for both of all stores, what I call the conventional or the, the total channel, but also kind of for the natural channel. And so... <clears throat> The reason that, that these reports I think can be helpful is as we see uh, tribal projects move forward, it's really, really important to understand who are the players out there and what is the competition that's, that's on the shelf. And we need to take a look if we're producing a product or the, the folks that are in that, that channel, are their sales growing or shrinking or you know, what's happening with them? And right now with you know, inflation being a, a factor, we need to know what the inflationary factors are, are doing um, to those, those products. So those are things that could be helpful. 
as, as we have this. So what we're measuring are really about six different areas. Um, on an individual basis, we're taking a look at what's the average retail price. Uh, the report that we have now captures the 52 weeks that ended December 26. So it's really what was the average retail price on the shelf at the end of 2021. Second thing is how does that compare to the average retail price of that same product in those same stores in December 2020. And so what's the absolute price increase or decrease that's happened over that period, but also what's the percentage that is increased or decreased. But then the last two categories take a look at that product as, as a whole, across the whole channel. What were the actual dollar sales in all of the stores for that product? And did those increase or decrease over the last year? And to me, even more importantly, what were the number of units? What were the number of packages? So maybe the dollar sales increased, but they sold less units. Um, and so, you know, all of those factors could be very helpful. So if we just take a look, this is a sample of part of the report that we have for the conventional. And if you take a look here, there's two things. First of all, if you take a look at the, at the bacon category, well, if you see here, the percentage price change, that's gone up 12% over the last year. Now, some of that may be due to some of the legislation that's going on in California and the like, but the reality is the price has gone up by 12%. But if you look, the number of sales have gone down by nearly 9%. So they're losing traction in, in a sense in the marketplace with that kind of performance. But if you go down to the jerky and the meat snacks area, those are areas where you've got about a 7% and a 9% and a increase in the retail price over the last year. But take a look at this. Their sales are continuing to grow by double digits. That shows you, you know, that's one of the factors that we call snackification is during COVID, people are working at home more. They're, that, they're going to the refrigerator. They're going to the cupboard. They're pulling out those snacks and, and eating those. And so that's something that, you know, we watch and say, okay, this is a really healthy trend for that product. So again, you can go onto the NAF website, you can go into our market reports and we'll have that, that market basket. And the thing I would say to any NAF grantees is that there are products, if there are products that you want to track, we can go into that SPINS database and start to mine some of that data for you. So finally, We'll get down to a um, project that I love to talk about just because I've been involved in this sector for about the last 20 years, but it's pet products. And it's an area where there's great opportunities for indigenous pro projects, but there's also some significant challenges. And you know, when you think about that, part of what I talk to people about tribal projects and particularly with, with processing uh, you know, beef or bison, the thing that people always talk about is, well, the Native Americans always use every part of the animal. And so that to me is very important. And pet products provide an opportunity for us to, to you know, continue that ethic that we have of using the whole animal. But the other thing is using the whole animal is, is critical for any meat processing project uh, to be financially stable. You know, I would love it if we could make all of our money on tenderloins, ribeyes, and strip steaks, but that's not the case. We've got to sell every part of that animal. And so that's why this is worth a, a really good look. So I want to talk, first of all, about just the dynamics. What's happening in the pet food space? Well, you're seeing that this category is growing year over year. Just in the last uh, four years, it's grown by 21%. And you're, you're seeing that um, half of that, half of those sales are really in, in the food and, and treats. You have everything else from, you know, supplies and veterinary care and, and all of those things. But the heart and soul of it is pet food and pet treats. Um, we're seeing pet adoption pretty well universal uh, across the board. You're seeing the lowest one is the Generation Z, which are just the, the people that are coming into that, um, you know, coming into the marketplace, the youngest consumers. But 
A lot of that is you're dealing with folks that are living in small apartments. They haven't gotten space to have a pet yet. And so, you know, we haven't seen that. But when you take a look at the millennials and, and the Generation X, um, and even the, the, the baby boomers, you know, there's a really strong uh, area there. And so you've got 69 million households that have got a, a dog, uh, 45 that have got a cat. And then you got to throw fish and, you know, some of the other critters in there as, as well. But we're going to focus primarily on, on the dogs and cats. So one of the things is, you know, humanization of pets. I talked about that as a trend earlier. And, you know, 30 years ago, Fido stayed outside and kept the burglars from breaking in the house and Fluffy wandered around and, and caught the mice. Well, Fido and Fluffy are probably in bed with us, you know, these days because uh, they're part of the family. And you see that in even the terminology. When I, I talk to folks that you go into the stores and, and you talk to folks about the, the pet space, um, you're, <clears throat> these are not pets, they're our companions, our companion animals. And we're not pet owners, we are pet parents these days. And so the marketing to the customers is all about the pets as an important part of our family and uh, how do we respect that. So when you take a look at that, you know, you, you see that most of the people know that um, they're concerned about their pet's nutrition. They know that what that pet is eating has got a big impact on its, on its health. And there's a growing awareness right now of, you know, traditionally a lot of pet food was just made with stuff. Um, there's a category that they call 4D. It stands for animals that are either dead, dying, diseased, or disabled. And that used to be the staple of what went into most pet products, but that's changing. And if you take a look at this little graphic here, you know, people are produce they're they're buying costumes for their pets at, at Christmas. They're buying gifts. They have birthday parties. Again, it's all part of that that the pets are part of our family. And so when you take a look at the marketplace, it's a very diversified marketplace. Um, you have pet specialty stores, the Petco's and the Pet Smarts that are a big share of it, but also a lot of independent mom and pop stores that are out there. You have a lot of food stores, uh, either your Kroger's and Safeways, as well as your natural food stores. And then online um, has been growing very sharply. And I think it's the major disruptor in our, in our marketplace. In 2015, the online share was about 7%. And by 2019, it had grown to 22%. And at the end of 2019, they said, well, we estimate that by 2004, we're going to be 24% of the marketplace. Then COVID came in and just blew the doors off of that. So that at the end of, of uh, 2020, it's actually a third. A third of the pet products are sold online. And again, you think about that in terms of some opportunities for indigenous products, is to be able to market those directly without having to go through um, the distributors and get onto the shelf at Petco or, or Kroger or whatever. So that's something to really keep our, our eyes on. And then it's important to understand who is buying what. The pet products, and particularly pet food, is very segmented. There is the, the value brands, the Old Roy, the Purina Dog Chow, the, those type of uh, pedigree, those type of things. And, you know, very reasonably priced, $8 for a 15 pound bag uh, uh, online at Walmart. But if you take a look at that, you've got ground whole grain corn, meat and bone meal. So you're not even really knowing which species that came from. Meat could be beef, it could be lamb, it could be bison, it could be whatever. Um, you've got soybean meal, you've got animal fat, again, is that poultry fat? Is that beef fat? Is that whatever? Um, corn gluten meal and chicken byproduct meal. So you can tell that that is just focused on the cheapest of the cheapest of the cheapest ingredients. Then you kind of have your conventional products, which is, I pulled out Beneful as, as one. They make some claims on there about, you know, real meat. Well, their lead ingredient is chicken. So they start off with an animal protein but then they've got the chicken byproduct meal and the barley, you know, whole grain. They go down to the grains very quickly. 
You've got your, in the natural channel, you've got your value natural brands. Rachel Ray is a good example of that. And, and she's got, you know, chicken, chicken meal, um, chicken fat, dried peas. So a higher grade of quality. But, you know, again, that 14 pound bag is just about a little over twice the price of the 15 pound bag of, of Old Roy. Then you've got the, the natural brands. Um, a good example is, is uh, Blue Buffalo. They're wilderness brands, and it starts off with deboned chicken, uh, chicken meal, peas. You know, you can go through there. It's even got some uh, some fish meal in there as a part of it. And then a premium brand, Origin, is a good example of that. And then they're just calling out. They've got chicken, turkey, flounder, whole mackerel, turkey giblets, whole herring. You don't see any meals in there at all and uh, they're using the whole ingredients. And then you've got the super premium that not only has those ingredients, but it's produced in a human grade kitchen and you know, all of those claims. And so there's an opportunity as we go forward to be able to, to fit within those markets. Um, and particularly you're, you're really seeing the growth right now in the natural, the premium and the super premium categories. But it's not as easy as it seems because the pet food category is highly regulated. And it's a very confusing set of regulations. Um, so it's kind of understand when you think about pet food, some of the regulatory authority over pet food is with the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. But because pet food is technically animal feed, um, it is also regulated very heavily by state departments of agriculture, state feed regulators. And so you have the federal regulators here, and then you've got 50 plus state feed regulators all making the regulations on, on pet food. And about 100 years ago, somebody said that doesn't make any sense. So they put together this nonprofit association called the Association of American Feed Control Officials, or AFCO. And its membership is made up of state feed regulators and the FDA. And so they get together periodically and they develop model regulations that actually have no regulatory authority, but in fact, every state defers to the AFCO regulations. So if I were to walk into Colorado where I'm at and, and to talk to my feed regulator and say, hey, I wanna do this with pet food, the first thing he would do is go to his bookshelf and pull out his AFCO book and go, okay, here's, here's what you can do. So even though AFCO has no regulatory authority, they are the regulators of, of pet food. So um, yeah, you can click there. You can go to the AFCO publications webpage. And, uh, oh, I thought I had, yeah. you'll get a book like this <laughs> that's about 500 pages long with, with all of the stuff in it. But it, it's kind of the Bible when it comes to producing pet products. Um, so, you know, within this Bible is, are some of the definitions. And we saw that when we looked at the brands, what's in there? Well, you know, poultry and meat. If it's just labeled poultry and, and meat, it's gotta be the whole meat, but it, Unless it says chicken, unless it says duck, whatever, if it just says poultry, it could be any of those. If it's meat, it could be, again, anything from beef to pork to, to whatever. The byproducts are defined as the products that are secondary to the main products. So if you think about it, the whole muscle is, is really the meat. But when you get into things like the kidneys or the, the liver or the bones or the fat, you know, those type of things, that's the byproduct. Ironically, heart tissue is, is the meat because it's a muscle. It's not a byproduct. So there's a lot of heart that go into pet products because they can be labeled as beef for chicken or whatever. And then meat or poultry meal, which is really the staple of, of a lot of pet foods, that is the rendered. They take these products in and under super high heat, they essentially reduce it to a powder. Um, and they do that because if you think about it, when you're making a, a pet product, that whole meat is about 80% water. And so if you're trying to produce a kibble or something like that, 
it's very expensive because you're taking that water out. And so a lot of companies, they take these rendered products because it comes in at about 10% moisture, but it's got very high, high protein. Um, and then you've got even the meat and bulk byproducts meal. And then the other claim I, I wanted to point out because this is one that I think could be an opportunity as we move forward with some projects. But if you have products that are labeled as human grade, it's not only the ingredients that are in there that have to be human grade, edible, you know, deemed uh, suitable for humans, but they actually have to be handled from start to finish in facilities that are human grade. So as soon as a product goes into a pet food manufacturing plant, it is deemed inedible for humans. Uh, they have to mark it with charcoal or something to say this can never go back into the human food system. And so those products, even though they could come out of the highest quality plant, cannot be labeled as human grade. Um, but if a product is made in a facility that also produces human foods, then they, they can label it as, as human grade. I threw in these two definitions uh, with bison and water buffalo because this is a relatively new development. As a number of pet food companies started to realize that bison had some real cachet, uh, they started to, to incorporate bison into their, into their uh, products. And um, the problem was bison can be relatively expensive. So then we had some companies that decided that what you could do is you could just start bringing in water buffalo from India or water buffalo ingredients and just labeling it as buffalo and with the right imagery on the front panel and everything, your customers would think that they were buying uh, real buffalo, North American buffalo. And so uh, the National Bison Association with the assistance of the Intertribal uh, Buffalo Council went to AFCO, the pet food regulators, and were successful in getting them to change these definitions so that uh, any of these products that are using water buffalo cannot deceive their customers at least in the ingredient panel. And, and we're very proud of that. A lot of folks have said, well, guys, we have all of these you know, products coming out. Let's make a pet food line. And it's important to understand that making pet food is relatively difficult. And that is because the regulations require that pet foods must be what they call complete and balanced. And the theory, the philosophy behind that is, is that our companion animals are getting all of their nutrition from that bowl of food that they eat once or twice a day, ignoring the fact that we feed them stuff from the table and everything else. But the theory is that's their sole source of nutrition. And so they need to have a complete nutritional, complete and balanced thing. And so if you see over there at the right, you'll see just some of the things of you can have a minimum of so much uh, you know, lysine in there, but you can only have a maximum. And, and things like vitamin A are, are very, if you put too much vitamin A into a product, it's, it's damaging to the livers of, of animals. And so, um, you know, having those there. You have to say that um, it, it's interesting, and, and this drives me nuts, you can call out on the front panel of a pet food product made with a certain ingredient as long as you have 3% of that ingredient in there. And we see this a lot with the bison products is they love to say made with bison um, and it'll have 3.1% uh, of the bison in there. The, if it's a formula, you can say it's a beef and bison formula, as long as those two ingredients make up 25% of, of the formula, uh, but neither ingredient can be less than 3%. So again, you end up with a formula that's 22% beef and 3% bison, but they, you know, those are some of the things. And then the human grade, I already talked about the requirements around that. So, you know, to understand then how we do this, let's, let's talk about how these products are, are manufactured. And we have a lot of different, the, the staple of, of the pet food business has always been the dry product, that kibble. Um, that comes out of the bag, easy to store, easy to feed, um, complete and balanced. The, the wet category or the canned category um, is close behind it, is, is second. 
And that can be, you know, what we call a loaf, which is that ground product, or a ragu, which is more of a stew with different types of ways in the can. And then we're seeing growth in dehydrated products. We're seeing um, emergence, uh, you know, if you watch, there's a company called Fresh Pet that's growing very quickly with refrigerated products and raw. You know, raw diets are, are catching on. And so how do we, we do that? Well, the thing to understand is that if we are producing these products, we have a, a processing plant and, and we have the, the hearts and the livers and we have the bones and, and these type of things is those products, those ingredients are not going to go straight to a manufacturing facility. There's a, a different layer in there of what we call pre-processors and they either pick up those ingredients and they take them to a rendering facility where they make them into a chicken meal or byproduct meal, or they will go to a processor where they make what they call a slurry and they grind up these products and they formulate them so that they've got the right amount of, of vitamins and minerals and ash and water content. And they either put those into big one-ton combo bins or they'll make them into uh, frozen, what we call nude blocks that then go to the manufacturers. And at that point, they're made into uh, the ingredients. And um, so this, it, it's really under, you know, important to understand because then when they get there, what happens is the manufacturing plants, if it's a dry facility, um, they're using primarily extruders to, to make the, these products. Or if it goes to a, a canning facility, they're using these giant retorts. And so if you're interested, you know, if that's what we want to get into with the, with the project, we got to look at investing in, in that kind of equipment. But what's important and interesting to note is that most of the major companies, Perina, um, uh, Mars, you know, the big brands, Pedigree, if they have a premium product, they are not generally manufacturing that in their own company-owned facilities. Because those big facilities to do the mass production and the like don't have the ability to really segregate out the ingredients and take the time to do it. So most of the premium products that even you see, like Blue Buffalo that I had or uh, Rachel Ray or any of those others, those tend to be made in co-packing facilities, which are facilities that just contract to, to manufacture those specialty project products. And one of the opportunities that we have for some indigenous projects is to perhaps develop a relationship with some of these major co-packers to provide some products for the manufacturing without having to go through these folks in the middle that are taking their cut from turning it into slurries or nude blocks. And I think that that's something we really need to investigate moving forward. And then, a much easier uh, channel to do other than pet food is pet treats. So this is area that's again growing for projects, but this is an easier way because with a pet treat, you're just making a claim that it's for um, intermittent feeding. It's not part of their major diet. So you don't have to make the nutritional, meet the nutritional bars on that that you have. And the other thing is within many of the facilities, you can use your existing equipment to make those products. Years ago, when I was involved with a, a pet food company, we had a great line of pet jerky treats. And the facility that was making it for us was a small meat processing plant in McPherson, Kansas. And they made a, um, a line of human jerky treats that were a chopped and formed jerky treats. And when we needed them to make our pet jerky treats, they changed the label on their machine and made those same products for, for that. And if you think about that in, in many of our things where we've got the smokers and the dryers and you know those type of things, we can take those, those products and make them into treats. And if you think back on, it, on those AFCO definitions, that's a human grade ingredient that was processed in a human grade facility that can be, then be labeled as human grade food for your companion animals. So that is something that I think is, is worth you know, exploring as, as we move forward. And particularly with all of the meat processing projects that are emerging within uh, Indian country, 
and NAF's vision of, of tribal food hubs, how can we work together with these projects to get the critical mass of ingredients to do something on a national scale? Uh, to me, that's a huge opportunity. So with that, um, you know, NAF has got great resources to help us move forward. Again, the, the quarterly market updates, the market basket report, the email updates. Um, I'm just really pleased to be working with NAF to, to provide some of this information and excited about anything that we can do moving forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. And we do have a couple questions here. Um, so one of them was if, it, if somebody wanted to start um, interacting with pet food, you've already given a lot of resources, but what else can they look up? Um, where should they go to get introduced to this industry? So uh, the, um, the Pet Food Institute is a nonprofit organization that represents most of the, of the companies, and they've got a lot of, of good resources. The American Pet Products Association, APPA, has got a lot of information that is readily available. Um, and then unfortunately, there's some of the data that, you know, there's some folks that um, package facts and some of the others do that is, you know, uh, you got to you got to pay for it. Spins does a separate and part of the package that we have with Spins doesn't include the, the pet stores. We look at, at the retail food stores where pet food is being sold and we can pull that. But um, because of our partnership with Spins, I think we can have the ability to at least pull some snapshots because they do have separate reports that track what's going on in Petco and PetSmart and some of the larger independent pet chains. So I would say, yeah, American Pet Products Association, Pet Food Institute, and then taking a look at some of these reports that can be purchased. Okay, thank you. And then we have one more. Um, so we've already talked a little bit about how COVID has changed the way people view food. Are there other big events that you've seen throughout your um, experience that has changed it as radically as COVID or other things that people should look out for on what consumers tend to look at that changes their opinions on things? So two of the things that I find, particularly in the natural channel, that have been drivers for years are the development of health issues, personal health issues, um, and having children. And um, we tend to call this that the baby boomers and the baby makers are, are two of the big drivers because you, know, you get to a point right now that people go in to their doctor and the doctor's saying, wow, your cholesterol's out of whack and, and your blood pressure is really high. And they're driving home saying, what well, I don't want to eat tofu. Um, and so what are the things that they do? And that's where people are taking a look at how can I take control of, of my personal health? The other thing is, uh, you know, when people have babies, all of a sudden that just kind of resets their, their process of, I've got this responsibility. I've got a new life that I'm responsible for. And they're depending on me. And if you go into the grocery stores today and you look at the baby food aisle, you'll see that organic and natural baby foods are a huge segment of that, which is, you know, interesting because you think new parents, you know, they're pinching pennies as it is, but they're making those conscious choices. So, you know, those are, are two ongoing um, factors that, that we have. And then the other one, I think, is just an overall... Um, uncertainty about our society and, and you know there's so much out there politics and, and whatever that just seems out of our control that we want to have we want to have connections we want to have a connection with that farmer or rancher who's raising our food we want to be able to visit with them and know how it was raised and how are they taking care of the land so you know I think that those are are some ongoing things that um, are not only very good trends for anybody that's in the natural or organic or, you know, local system, but when you think about the, the branding for naturally native products, that is a, a, a really big uh, opportunity. 
All right. I think that is everything that we had in. Thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you next time.